what I'm going to talk about then is uh, the Clives in India, unsurprisingly. Uh, so to give you a quick rundown of what that's going to consist of, um, I'm initially going to talk about the project that I've been working on with uh, the University of Oxford National Trust, then give you a little bit more history. Um, I'll try not to go over the same stuff as Erwood did earlier, then look at the collection and uh, how it's collected, then where it ends up and how it's displayed, and then sort of an inkling of how things change uh, over the generations. So as we've seen, this is uh, the Clive Museum now in Paris Castle, roughly a couple of years ago. Um, and the the project that I've been working on. So to give you an idea, so uh, the National Trust and the University of Oxford um, are in a partnership together on various things, um, which has been going pretty well, if I might say so. Uh, but um, uh, part of it has been this collaboration on, on the Clive collection, um, which the National Trust has been um, part of an even larger effort, uh, which stems from, as, uh, as I understand it, and no one's here today from the National Trust because they're on furlough, so I'm going to try and give you a, an understanding of how I see things, but hopefully that's correct. Um, so as I understand, sort of the, the stem is from the Everyone Welcome uh, campaign, which is sort of, an, as I believe again, uh, it's an aspiration for uh, a diverse, inclusive, relevant and continually learning as an organisation for National Trust. Um, to that end, they've uh, done several things. Uh, there are some joint doctoral studentships with Oxford and Cambridge, and I think some other elsewhere as well, one of which is looking at the Clive's collection. Um, there's community engagement projects and volunteer training, etc. cetera. Um, there have been art commissions and there has been some reinterpretation in Powys uh, around the collection, though uh, that project is definitely still ongoing. For my part, I've been uh, working on several things with the National Trust. Um, so some of that is made up of provenance research, um, which I'll go into a bit more detail, lots of diving in archives, looking for exactly where the objects now in the Clive collection actually came from. Uh, we've also had some student internships to help with the project, including uh, looking at the dispersal of the collection in the 20th century, uh, or some of the collection, and um, also trying to match up some of the documentary evidence that I've been finding and trying to sort of, as a team, come together and decide what we think that particular document might refer to and which item is it likely to be um, that's now in the collection. Um, I've been working on a knowledge exchange uh, with uh, the Ashmolean Museum and the National Trust. Um, there's a bit of disruption to that because of coronavirus, um, uh, but uh, yeah, the idea is to the two organisations to discuss and work together to see how they can uh, approach and deal with the questions around their colonial collections. And uh, all of this is sort of hopefully uh, pushing towards a research-led reinterpretation of the Clive collection, but this is a much longer project than this, and this, is, this uh, talk is much uh, sort of a very short summary of what's been done by me uh, so far and what I've unearthed, uh, hopefully, which will be quite interesting. Um, so, our bits of history then. So, Robert Clive, here we are. Um, he was from the middle ranks of the gentry originally, so not well, hugely wealthy, but certainly one of the better classes of uh, British society. Um, but he wasn't um, particularly good. Uh, he was a terrible teen. Um, he was expelled from several schools. He got involved in some sort of protection racket in Market Drayton when he was younger. Um, and his father seems to have had enough of him at some point and uh, heavily encouraged Sash sent him to India with the East India Company as a merchant. He later on joins the army and rises through the ranks um, and eventually sort of becomes uh, president of Bengal, uh, which is the sort of the strongest, the highest position in the East India Company in India. Uh, as we heard earlier, he's associated with two sort of big moments, uh, the Battle of Plassey, which even in contemporaries referred to it as a sort of revolution in Bengal in which the uh, Nawab is overthrown, a new Nawab put in place at the behest of the company, and uh, certain amounts of control are then excised by the company in Bengal. And then we have, as we heard about Shah Alam, the grant of the Diwani, the tax rights in Bengal, but effectively, because at this point, Shah Alam is essentially a prisoner of the East India Company, it's, these rights are much more than what is put on paper and um, are not necessarily negotiated. Um, so that's the East Indian Company start its, its spread to control over most of India. Uh, to some in the time, he was an imperial hero. To others, he was a greedy nabob. Um, I think there's some debate about that now, but um, I know where I stand. Uh, he was certainly um, driven but, and desired a, uh, you know, his position in society, but was incredibly unstable, angry, sometimes violent, drunk, opium addict, uh, here, um, and may have taken his own life um, 
So yeah, um, interesting character, bit nasty. Uh, Edward Clive, quite different to his father. Um, he went to Eden Oxford, married Henry after Herbert, and then later is made Earl of Powys in his own right. Um, he, when he goes to India, is a subordinate governor um, in Madras. He's not in charge, unlike his father. Um, this is the period when Richard Wellesley is governor general, and it's him who's pushing things with actually Wellington, the future Duke of Wellington, sort of on the sidelines, occasionally butting in. Um, and the sort of, as we heard, the main ad adversary at this point is Tipu Sultan. Uh, and the third Angry Mysore saw War is what will take up a lot of Edward's time, and will, but it will be mainly directed by Richard Wellesley. In terms of character, Edward's, yeah, gentleman-like, he's diligent, but yeah, he's uninspired. I wouldn't go as far as to say stupid, but he's, he's not seen as a natural leader. Henrietta, for her part, um, she's a Welsh aristocrat from a very old family. Uh, her marriage, therefore, to Edward is you know, a sort of classic of the old name meets new money. Um, and uh, she joins Edward um, in India with her daughters, which is unusual at the time, um, and then embarks on a grand tour. Uh, again, very unusual. Once peace has uh, sort of, you know, been installed, uh, she goes on a tour around Mysore and surrounding regions. Um, she's a naturalist and a collector, um, but she's also, when she's visiting, acting as a soft power diplomat. So I think that can be lost, but um, yeah. It's quite interesting reading her diary. She's clearly adventurous and she's quite perceptive. Her diaries give a sense of which someone who understands what's going on around her in a way that maybe Edward might not. The, the collecting habits of Henrietta are much more focused on things like this. Um, uh, geological samples, plants, animals, either alive or stuff. They have a huge menagerie. So she's not going on a giant shopping trip around South India. Um, but uh, yeah. So some of the things that she, one of the things she does collect is obviously this uh, tiger's head finial on the right here, um, which is now in the collection, but that's given to her via intermediaries via Richard Wellesley, which we'll come back to. Um, the tent, uh, this sword, there's another sword, there are other items, the slippers. Um, don't know how she got hold of them, but her letters to Edward and her diaries don't record her picking them up in Seringapatam or Mysore. So there remains a bit of a mystery around those. Um, and the picture here is um, of Anna Tonelli, the daughter's governess, uh, reimagining the throne. The throne by this point, by the time that Henrietta arrives in the Sunga Potam, it's broken up completely. Um, so this is from memories of officers who took part in this or watched the dismantling. Other things in the collection then, uh, we've got arms and armor, um, courtly objects, richly decorated everyday sort of things. Um, Books, textiles, clothing, uh, again, sort of objects that, that everyday use. And then we've got uh, art, furniture, um, decorative arts. And finally, there's lots of jewels, or there were lots of jewels. So these are all um, no longer in the Clive collection in, uh, in Powys. Um, they've been sold in recent years and are now elsewhere. But um, as you can see, the sort of, there were some fantastic uh, uh, items here. Now, yeah, so I've broken these up into uh, sort of categories of how the sort of items that are in the collection what they were interested in so that but how they sort of function so objects of diplomacy things that were gifts or used in diplomatic settings for instance a hookah pipe um objects of warfare objects of everyday use and uh, objects of display um digging up where they came from then uh, involved diving into the archives so uh, that involved lots of uh letters to and from the clives uh, account books and uh, inventories, sometimes taken for purposes of wills, etc., or other other purposes, shipping manifests, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's dug up quite a lot. So here is a spread of um, of all the things I can trace to an origin of where items that were in the Clive collection came from originally. Um, so you can see there's a lot of a lot of things. Um, in the south of India, most of the items pinpointed there are to do with uh, Edward and Henrietta. Um, then in the north of India, going along the Great Trunk Road, you've got items going into Calcutta. Um, they're mostly Robert's collection. And then you've got uh, items coming from Japan, Iran, Pakistan, um, uh, Indonesia, uh, Sri Lanka. Those again are being picked up in various ways, usually through intermediaries and purchases of gifts, um, and eventually coming into the Clive collection, usually Robert's. Um, most of those items. 
So having looked at a lot of uh, things, we've got a roughly, I've got records of roughly about 500 or so items that were in the collection at one time or other. Um, they break up looking a bit like this. So the, the collection was mostly built up by a long way by, Rob, by Robert. Um, but in terms of actual origins, the origin of most things, like three, over three quarters, is still unknown. Um, you can be su supposition, maybe some of them, but the paperwork doesn't look, get us anywhere. Um, but the, the, the rough quarter that we do know, uh, half of that comes in as a gift, and the rest is broken down into purchase. Then loot is actually the smallest fragment of that. However, um, things like loot are not necessarily as well documented as things like gifts, which have letters going to and from saying thank you, etc. So there are some interesting things here. And the, 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 the paperwork that I've looked at, which is all the Clive's paperwork and some of the East India Company paperwork, leads to certain results that won't record everything. So it's important that even though these look sort of like it's telling us a story, there's, there are definite caveats to the sort of, you know, how certain we are about that. Now, a, cu a couple of objects I want to, to focus on. The first one is this, actually. Um, it's a portrait of Zimadala um, by Thomas Hickey from 1803. Um, this was given by Zim to Edward Clive. Uh, he was the heir of Muhammad Ali Khan Raja and um, who had been restored to power in the Carnatic by Robert Clive and then uh, later on is granted the succession um, over others by the East India Company under Edward Clive's influence. So the two families have got a fairly intimate relationship. Um, in doing so, um, when he is made the new Nawab, uh, the position is reduced from one with sort of actual power to a sort of thick head titular power. The East India Company at this point is in Madras, uh, is the sort of real significant power here. Um, so the gift actually acts as sort of a diplomatic exchange in some ways to strengthen the ties between uh, his family and the Clives and sort of enhances his legitimacy. Um, he writes a letter saying, please take this home and put it up in your house, which duly really happens. Um, however, a very different sort of uh, way of acquiring something uh, like the Tiger's Head Finial. This was obviously once part of the throne at Sering Britain belonging to Tipu Sultan. Like I said, it was broken up and uh, looted after the battle. Um, some parts uh, were given to the royal family, um, which are still in the royal collection, I believe. And uh, this uh, one finial was given to Henrietta by Richard Wellesley, um, he having received it uh, from one of the uh, infantry officers at the time. Uh, it's instantly, it's a trophy of war. There's no other way of looking at it straight away. It's a trophy of war and it's displayed as such. Um, and written about such. So going to Paris Castle then, um, how were the items from the collection originally displayed? So we've got inventories and letters that detail how the Clives displayed their things and we've got photos at least going back to the 30s about how things were set out in, um, in Paris at the time. So here we can see that things that are actually from uh, India or China uh, are highlighted now you can see some Chinese vases, but uh, also you've got boxes, in, uh, three boxes on the tables, which are from India. Um, and this is sort of the similar way in which things are shown throughout uh, Powers Castle, all the variety of, of uh, houses that the, the Clives and then the Herbert family, as they change their name again, uh, own. Uh, so again, here we can see the ballroom uh, come gallery. Uh, in 36, you can see that there's some Indian items uh, in various places and, and still in 1970, again, things moved a bit, but uh, essentially you can still see that you've got um, India or, or Chinese items um, collected via the Clive's uh, on display. And then here's the ballroom today, um, looking the other direction. Uh, into the Clive Museum here um, at the back, you can see the door. Above it now sits uh, Benjamin West's painting of the Grant of the Diwani. Uh, that wasn't there originally, um, but is now there. And it sort of uh, frames the collection in a really interesting way. But next to it, you can see is um, on the right is Hickey's portrait of Azimadala. Uh, the display boards in front of the Clive collection um, are actually written by me. Um, and they're adding to give us some sort of background as to visitors when they go in to what they're about to see because the current interpretation in there is really visually spectacular but um, it's quite hard to, to 
understand, I think, as a member of the public, what this collection is, why it's significant, who collected it. So this is at least some way towards going to sort of giving some sort of context to what is in Paris Castle. Here's the, um, the Clive Museum roughly a few years ago. Uh, as you can see, everything that is on display is, uh, is you know, it's quite nice. But uh, it didn't always look like this. That's the thing. This is um, this is display was put in in 1987, I think, or maybe a little bit before, um, to sort of give a sense of a museum. But um, this space was a museum, but it didn't look like this necessarily. So we can have a look at what was going on here prior to the National Trust's intervention. Um, so it was used as a billiard room for a while, but prior to that, it was probably a more dedicated museum space. Um, in 1939, the Welsh Girls' School takes over Powys Castle and uses the museum. You can see that the billiard table here has, got a, has been converted into a table um, for the girls to do work on, but you can see that there's, um, there's collections surrounding it. So the animals and um, whatnot are things, probably some of it's, a lot of it's Henrietta, but it's probably Edward and, and future generations have added to it, but the core, the sort of the starting core of that collection of wildlife and rocks, etc., is from Henrietta. Um, you can see there's some Indian um, animals as well and uh, furniture and bits and pieces. Um, but we can go further back, and that's as far as photos get us. Um, but uh, if we sort of zoom in, here's it, it's in this 87, uh, 81, sorry. Um, but um, there seems to have been a museum in this sort of, in this space at least, of some sort or other, from about 1809 onwards, built by Edward, Henrietta, and their son, Edward, um, sort of together. Um, and in 1846, we get a snippet of uh, a visitor uh, who writes in, in a, a tourist guide what can be found at the castle and, and mentions that at the end of the gallery, there is a, another room, a sort of museum of curiosities brought from India by the great Lord Clive. Um, already in 1846, the sort of the second generation of Clives are wiped out from the story. Um, and it's this consisted of birds and fossils, etc., both rare and valuable. Amongst the antiquities, so there's also antiquities in the, in, the, in the museum space, is a model of an elephant covered with a coat of a male with two Indians on its back. Now that has left the collection, however, it's now in the Royal Armouries in Leeds. Um, and through the magic of technology, we can actually put the elephant back in the room. Sorry, that was supposed to work, and there we go. There, elephant, back in room. Beautiful, everyone applaud. Um, so, to conclude this talk, um, Robert received quite a lot of gifts. Um, that's clear. And if he were either given to secure his favour or to avert his wrath, either one. Um, well, Edward and Henrietta were forbidden from accepting gifts from Indians. The rules had changed by the time that they are in India. Um, as a result, items that are looted um, or Indian items generally come via Europeans who either purchase them to give as gifts to Edward or Henrietta to secure favour in some way, or um, they're swapping things around. Um, they know that Edward and Henrietta are interested in collecting certain items and the letters detail what is being sent. Um, Robert then looks like he doesn't have so much loot in terms of what's in the collection now. So items uh, that survive aren't necessarily loot because the things that Robert takes in loot are gold and jewels. Uh, and these are then converted once back in Britain into property and other things and, and um, disappear that way. So um, either way, it's important to stress that the family fortune is the result of, of colonialism and violence, definitely. Um, one thing to say that about the way the collection is used is that Robert definitely used his collection. There's items in that collection which Robert personally were very, was very familiar with um, and interacted with, which isn't true of Edward. Edward's collection and Henrietta's collection is much more things to look at, things that are displayed to make a statement. Robert, I think, was at the centre of the history, and I think Edward and Henrietta, to a certain extent, wanted to be, and the collection display of it in a museum is about trying to bring them and their family into the story of, of the British Empire. And over the generations after them, the collection moves from familiarity uh, to becoming um, foreign curios um, so that by the 20th century what the purpose of a lot of the objects are is unknown, how they were arrived at absolutely unknown um, and are treated as sort of uh, interesting curios but that's about it.